Indiana Jones is one of my favorite franchises, and I think that's a true testament of how good Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Last Crusade really are. Because in all honesty, half of the franchise isn't even that good. I would not be particularly upset if I never saw Temple of Doom or Kingdom of the Crystal Skull ever again. And that got me thinking, why do people almost universally like the first and third installments better than the second and the fourth installments? And so, I want to answer the question, what makes a good Indiana Jones film? While making the first Indiana Jones film, Lucas and Spielberg were trying to harken back to the movies of their childhood, to the Saturday morning adventures they saw when they were young. And so because of that, they tried to make action similar to those sequences, but just more advanced. And I think the key to it all is structure. Look at the first sequence from Raiders of the Lost Ark. You are slowly, inch by inch, taken through the jungle and the temple that Indy will later run out of. You know every obstacle, the order in which they appear, and the possible ways that Indy can overcome those obstacles. So when everything goes to hell and Indy has to dash out of there, bada bing, bada boom, you still feel in control. Yeah, it's a little chaotic, but you still feel cool, calm, and collected, just like Indy feels. And when the boulder comes in, when Spielberg throws in a curveball, that's when the chaos breaks out. Indy has to quickly sprint away from the boulder and then sprint away from a bunch of chasers pursuing him. It's brilliant because you knew so much beforehand. You knew all the obstacles. And then when Spielberg throws in those curveballs, everything changes. You are in Indy's shoes. While he was once pretty confident that he could get out of that temple, just he had to do it quickly, now he's sprinting for his life, trying to make it back to the plane, screaming like a madman. It's brilliant, because Spielberg knows in order to have that actual sense of danger and chaos, you first have to have structure to everything. Structure is the key to these action sequences. Take the gunfight in Marion's Tavern. It's relatively simple. Indy is facing off a bunch of guys with guns. You know the capabilities of each gun. You know where the thugs are at every time. You know where Indy is. You know where Marion is. Everything is simple. But the added layer of the fire, the fact that the tavern is going to burn down, adds this sense of urgency, and that's where the chaos stems from. Same thing with one of the thugs showing up behind Indy. Really, you should know where all of the guys are, but the fact that you're dazed and confused like Indy is, you lose track of everyone, and you're just incredibly worried and overwhelmed by the situation that's at hand, similar to Indy. This structure is applied to every single sequence in the entire film, and it's what makes the sequences so entertaining. Take, for instance, the fist fight in the streets of Cairo. Relatively simple fist fighting, but because it comes out of nowhere, because the thugs randomly appear and Indiana and Marion are overwhelmed, we as the audience feel that same emotion. And when Marion is captured and Indiana doesn't know where she is, bada bing, bada boom, that's another layer of tension, excitement, and it's brilliant. Indiana and Marion are trapped with a bunch of snakes, relatively okay. You know, we're fine. Oh, wait a minute. The fire on the torches are going out. That's a problem. Another layer of tension and excitement. What about later when Indy is simply fighting a Nazi soldier? Uh-oh! A plane's border blades may take his freaking head off. And oh yeah, Marion is trapped in the plane and the plane may explode. It's brilliant because all these concepts are so simple, but it's these little additions that make them exciting. A convoy chase later. Okay, it's fine, but oh, wait a minute, Indy is hanging off everywhere, and there are cliffs, and he falls under one of the trucks, and it's insane, not because in theory, you know, it's a particularly complex action sequence, because there are little moments of excitement that makes the entire sequence so brilliant. Then you look at Temple of Doom's first action sequence, and oh, whoa, whoa, oh, oh, oh god. Oh, Steven, I think you have some explaining to do for making me throw up. This is just a complete mess. Everything before the action sequence doesn't at all incorporate its elements into the action sequence. It's just Indy talking about nonsense to a bunch of thugs. And so when the action sequence finally comes around, you have Harrison Ford stumbling around like a drunk looking for an antidote. You have Willie looking for a diamond. You have balloons coming down. You have a bunch of thugs coming in. It feels so cheap. This sequence would be fine in any other action film franchise, but it's insulting in Indiana Jones. It's insulting because it's so lazy and it feels so artificial. There are no actual thrills here. And I think part of that is to do with the cuts. Because you have to focus on Indiana and Willie and the diamond and the antidote and focus on where all of them are, 
There are too many cuts, and it gets chaotic, but not in the good way. Like, I actually feel nauseous watching this scene. I'm not kidding. And when Indy, Willie, and Short Round are all on the raft going down the side of the mountain, that is the same deal. It's a, ba a bunch of bad 80s cuts with the actual actors behind some stupid blue screen, and then the actual stunt people going down the mountain. It feels so cheap, and once again, there's no structure there. It feels like a bunch of cheap thrills. The sequence where Indy and Short Round are about to be crushed by spikes would be amazing if it were not for Willie's incessant, incessant screaming. And I'll get to that later, but when it comes to the other action sequences, I think the fight with the Rock Crusher is incredible because it goes back to that old structured formula. Okay, Indy's fighting this guy. Oh, wait a minute, he's on a Rock Crusher. And oh, wait a minute, he has a voodoo doll that's continuously getting stabbed by a little kid, and Short Round has to stop the kid so Indy can regain his strength and not get injured by the voodoo doll in order to defeat the guy on the Rock Crusher. It sounds like a lot, but it really isn't, because it's executed so well. You're introduced to every element slowly. It never feels like you're getting overwhelmed with information or cuts. It's perfectly edited, so you're introduced to everything slowly. You can absorb all of it, and by the end, it's just one of the most satisfying action sequences in the entire series. Unfortunately, the last couple of action sequences really disappoint. The mine shaft sequence plays extremely similar to the raft sequence. And the final showdown, yeah, the sequence on the bridge is awesome, but the actual action itself, when Indy's just slicing guys up with the sword like a goddamn ninja, even though he's never used it before, once again, has that lazy sort of feel to it that the first sequence had. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, action-wise, has, yes, that great rock crusher sequence, but besides that, is an overall failure. Come last crusade, Steven Spielberg just said, ah, you know what, nah, I, I, I remember how to do action now, and suddenly everything's fantastic again. Okay, Indy's on a train, oh, he's fighting guys now, now there are animals inside that he has to deal with, deal with, like snakes and lions, then he has to get out and get off the train. So many elements, so many layers packed into a simple concept of Indy getting chased by a bunch of guys for a relic. And then, with the boat fight, same thing. Very simple. Indy's fighting a bunch of guys. Oh, wait a minute. The rain and the waves are so strong that everyone's falling off the boat. The boat chase, pretty simple. Oh, wait. Two boats are closing in on each other. It's going to crash into Indy's boat. The boat's going to be destroyed. Oh, wait a minute. Now the boats are getting destroyed by rotor blades. What's going on here now? It's the simplicity that makes the scene so enthralling. Nothing is complex about Indy and his father getting strapped to two chairs and a fire going off in the room. It's so simple. All they can do is bicker and wobble around on the chair, but it's exciting because then you get to see the Nazis, and now there's a means of escape through the fireplace, but now the Nazis are shooting at them. And it adds so much excitement to all these sequences. The simplicity and structure is key. The motorcycle chase, the tank sequence at the end, both have the simple concepts, but are executed with other layers, with Brody being inside the tank, with the tank meeting a cliff. Other vehicles are coming in with other guys. It's so insane, but it's so simple in theory. It's such a simple concept, and when you have that simple concept and that structure in store, you can build on it with other elements. And it, what makes the tank sequence one of the greatest action sequences in film history. Then, you know, two decades later, Steven Spielberg was just like, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna, you know, go back to the Temple of Doom style. An incredibly fast-paced, yet at the same time, lazy chase through a warehouse, culminating in one of the stupidest decisions ever made in film. Why is this fridge sequence even a thing? Then later in the film, after constantly underwhelming us with action sequences, Spielberg just says, screw it. Shia LaBeouf, monkeys, sword fight on top of two trucks, waterfall cliff. I mean, there's so much going on here, and it's just all happening at once, and the CGI does not help at all either, but I think it's honestly just because it's so outlandish and fast-paced that it makes everything come at you so fast you can't take it all, and you're just left thinking, what the hell am I watching? The tank sequence, the tank is moving so incredibly slow. It's like Gary the goddamn snail, but it works because of that. Speed is so important, and it's okay if you have a fast-paced sequence like the boat sequence in Indiana Jones 3, but at the same time, you have to give some structure there. And then Harrison Ford is duking it out with this other old guy, and Spielberg just said, ants. 
We're going to do ants, and that's it. That's the final showdown right there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm legitimately concerned for anyone who is involved with this film when it comes to the action. It's just horrible. There's just so many things going on at once, and it's all coming at you at such a high speed that you can't take it all in. And the action just feels stupid because of that. It feels lazy and like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom artificial, not helped at all by the CGI. And so I think that the two keys to the action here are structure and simplicity. The scenes that I love, that so many people adore, are so simple. They're such simple concepts with just other layers on top of them. And at the same time, you know the geography of everything. How many guys are in a room? What's the layout of the room? Hell, what guns they have? Because we know so much information, it's when Steven Spielberg throws in those curveballs, like the boulder, that everything turns to hell. And we feel that chaos and the tension that Indy would feel, and that's the key. Structure and simplicity are the key to these action sequences, and they're the key to good Indiana Jones films. But that's not the only key. Oh no, this is a multiple locked door, ladies and gentlemen. And the second key, side characters. Marion and Sala set incredibly high standards in Raiders of the Lost Ark for great side characters. And I understand that, you know, those standards are not always met. But I mean, come on, there could have at least been an attempt. Let's compare Marion and Willie. Marion, yes, is bubbly, she's feminine, and she's lovable, but at the same time, she's independent, she's strong. She doesn't feel like someone that's a burden to Indiana Jones. She feels like an actual love interest and important to the story itself. Willie, on the other hand, oh boy, oh, oh boy. Marion is a self-made woman. She has her tavern, she's doing all right even after the incident's coinciding with her father. Willie, on the other hand, is a spoiled singer who just wants luxury. She doesn't want anything else, and so when she sees the ridiculous Indian stereotypes in the bugs, she just screams and complains non-stop. And I get that, you know, in any given situation, yeah, a regular woman like that, yeah, could have been scared. Hell, men could have been scared. I could have been scared. But I don't think I would have been screaming that much. It's so annoying, and it kills every scene she's in. Every scene she's in is basically just her screaming and getting grossed out, and it just ends up being annoying. Halfway through the film, I'm done with Willie. After she ruined the crushing spike sequence, I'm done. I don't care if she could redeem herself in the second act because you've already ruined her in the first. And oh my god, did they not redeem her because she gets supposedly even worse. Even in the final set piece in the entire movie with the bridge, she is saying, oh, Indiana, you're so crazy. Just god damn, will you just shut up and please just go along with something? You're freaking crazy. Then you got short round. I don't hate Short Round. I thought he was okay, but the problem is the type of comedy he brings to the table. Sala was a more mature character. Yes, he was very childish in a way, but at the same time, he brought a mature type of humor to the Indiana Jones franchise. But on the other end, you have Short Round making stupid 80s jokes that only little kids would laugh at. And yes, these films are made partly for kids, but it completely appalls the other side of the audience. You're appalling older people who love these films with these stupid jokes because that's so much what he is. Yes, his moments when he's actually scared and actually courageous are incredible, but because in his comedic moments he doesn't succeed like Sala, those moments are diminished. When Sala's courageous, when Sala has his moments, it feels more rewarding because you love him so much. Because Shuround doesn't deliver on those jokes, those triumphant moments of his just feel underwhelming. Come Indiana Jones 3, not only did Spielberg bring back Sala and Marcus Brody, two lovable characters, but he also added Elsa and Indy's father. Let's start with Elsa. Elsa is easily the most beautiful of all the women that Indiana Jones has been with, and because of that, she works perfectly for a person that seduces Indiana Jones. But it's not just that, it's her passion. It's her confidence. She's so passionate about the work that's given to her, and she's so confident that she will succeed. And while she is evil and succumbs to greed and trying to get the Holy Grail, she's sort of the female Indiana Jones. She has that confidence. She's willing to do whatever it takes to get to the goal, but unlike him, she doesn't learn that sometimes it's just not worth it. She's just as lovable as Marion, but her seductiveness, her accentuated beauty, her confidence, her passion for what she does really adds to this character and makes her feel so different. 
Speaking of different, you gotta talk about Sean Connery's performances in these dead. This was so perfect because this was the first time that we really saw Indiana get bossed around. Them bickering was the funniest part of the entire Indiana Jones franchise, in my opinion. It was funny seeing a hero that we were so confident in that he was gonna succeed constantly bicker with his own dad about what to do and his mom. Indy's dad not only adds an excellent element of comedy to this film, but also sort of grounds the film. He, like Elson in Indiana, is passionate about what he does and the Holy Grail, but he talks about the sacrifices that he had to make with his family in order to accomplish getting the Holy Grail. He shows he's a player, just like Indiana. He has such similarities to Indiana and it makes you believe he's his father so much and we're all of these character traits of Indiana stem from. Yet, essentially, he still feels different. He's more quirky. He's unorthodox in a way. And he's wiser because of all his adventures. And by the end, he's the one that finally can convince Indiana to let the Holy Grail go and let his passions about getting these artifacts go. Because ultimately, their goal was to keep it out of the Nazis' hands. And that's something that they ultimately did. And then we get to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Oh god. Mac was just simply unmemorable. I just can't put it past that. He just had no nuance to him. Oh yeah, he's double cross and everyone. So entertaining. Yeah, just didn't stick with me at all. Marion's husband, bumbling idiot, not funny at all. Shia LaBeouf does not match Harrison Ford at all. Two words. Leather jacket. Does that scream Indiana Jones to you? I don't think so. He just has such a punk mood to him, and he doesn't feel righteous at all. At least in Last Crusade, yeah, Indiana had that punk teenager sort of feel to him, but River Phoenix captured that he's still righteous and still wants to do the right thing. Shia LaBeouf says, screw that and just become a punk teenager with a leather jacket. I'm still upset over this. Why is he wearing a leather jacket? Good God, that is not Indiana Jones at all. No, but in all seriousness, the problem here is that Indy and his relationship and his father with Last Crusade was stunned so well, and because of that, those standards were just simply never going to be met, but unfortunately, Shia LaBeouf failed to capture any essence of Indiana Jones. He didn't feel cool, calm, and collected, or righteous, or confident, or passionate about what he did. He didn't make those funny remarks. He didn't show the anger or the worry when certain situations arose. He just wasn't Indiana Jones' son, and that ultimately kills the film because that dynamic is so essential and so focused on. Marion is back, but it just feels sad bringing her back. Yeah, she still has that confidence to her, but it's just so in your face this time and just annoying by the end. They feel as though there's this need that she has to have this relationship with her son and Indiana and they have to resolve everything. And there's just so much resolving going on and explaining what happened in the past that she has no character development. She has no character moments at all. And it just feels as though she's a waste. Side characters have been so essential to this franchise's successes and failures. You need these characters to be memorable and serve their purpose. It's so clear what side characters are going to work and what side characters are not going to work. Oh my gosh, Indy's father is so much like him, but at the same time, he's quirky and still is different. And then you have Indy's son, who does not feel like him at all, and is punky and Shia LaBeouf. You have Mary and Elsa, both defying stereotypes of women in action films. And then you have Willie, who's the typical damsel in distress. It's cut and dry. There's no two ways about it. These films either have great side characters and are great films, or they have not so great side characters and are not so great films. And the final aspect, tone and villains. It doesn't seem as though those two elements are directly connected, but trust me here, they are. Belloc is the perfect Saturday morning villain. He's so corny, but at the same time has his maniacal moments. And so because of that, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark is, in a sense, a B-movie. It has those campy moments, but at the same time, it knows when to take itself seriously. And that difference, the constant switching between taking this extremely seriously, perhaps over-seriously, and then switching back to that campy attitude with a monkey following around Marion, it's perfect. There are constant switches, and because of that, the pacing of this movie is probably the best out of any film ever the reason why Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark is still watched today is because it's never boring. It knows exactly what it wants to be when it wants to be. Some people would argue Temple of Doom has that similar campiness to it, but it doesn't execute it as well. The main villain is just 
a little bit too over the top. And I think that sort of defines all the stereotypes in Temple of Doom. They're so exaggerated and bombastic. And I guess the solution was, oh, hey, let's make these other sequences dark as hell. You have a guy ripping out a man's heart out of his chest. What the hell? Why is this even a thing? Yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark had some pretty dark moments, but they saved that for the end of the film. This is like halfway through, not even. And then Indiana Jones gets brainwashed. You know how dark that is for a sequel to go? And I understand that sequels can be darker and it's a bold move. Move, but you can't do that and then have Willy screaming and a bunch of bugs crawling on her and striking soup out of like a monkey's head. The tone is so drastic and swings back and forth violently and the shifts aren't as smooth. You have moments when it's super serious that's dragged on for like 15 minutes and then you have comedy for 15 minutes. There's not as good of a balance here and because of that you get sick of the comedy halfway through. You're eight minutes in you're like god damn I want this to stop. I want to go back to the serious stuff now. But then it gets over serious and Indy is hitting short round and you're just like why? Why is this even a thing? It's too dry drastic and its transitions are not smooth enough where I can excuse it for its tonal problems. Then Last Crusade, Elsa and Walter Donovan, both comical villains, both campy, but at the same time a little more serious. And I think that matches with the tone of Last Crusade a little better. Yes, you have the quirky moments with Sean Connery, but damn, is this film serious sometimes. It feels as though it takes the Nazi opposition very seriously. There are dreadful moments in this film. I mean, the book burning scene is evidence enough. Indiana is seconds away from choking Elsa in order to get the book back, in order to keep the Holy Grail out of the Nazis' hands. Last Crusade takes a more serious approach, but because it's not afraid to, it doesn't feel drastic. It feels as though this is just a more serious but not dark version of Indiana Jones, and that's something that everyone can enjoy. And now we're back to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull again, and it's not pretty. Kate Blanchett is an excellent actress, but I feel as though she was asked to play this role just as bland and as campy as she can. This isn't even the Saturday morning villain-esque. This is just bad James Bond villain-esque. It's so bland, and because of that, the film doesn't know if it wants to be super serious at times or just comical. And because of that, the tone feels incredibly boring. At least I can look back at Temple of Doom and say, you know what, they tried here. They were doing something different, and no, it didn't work, but they tried. Here, it just feels like another generic action film, and that's not what Indiana Jones is. You know what Indiana Jones is? Indiana Jones is having simple action sequences whose top priority is to entertain you by adding layers of tension and excitement, all in order to thrill the audience watching the film. Indiana Jones is about having side characters that break genre stereotypes and are extremely entertaining to watch. And most important of all, Indiana Jones is about hearkening back to that lost era of Saturday morning adventures. You can make the tone more serious like Glass Crusade did, but you can never lose sight of why Indiana Jones was created originally. To take action movies back to what they should be. Simply entertaining with excellent pacing in order to thrill and entertain the audience for however long the film actually is. It's why Raiders of the Lost Ark and Last Crusade stand the test of time, because they're entertaining, and that ultimately is what films should be. Thank you guys so much for watching, and see you all next time.